So now that we discussed the details of the eight steps of the citric acid cycle, let's actually summarize our results. So we have the citric acid cycle, also known as the tricarboxylic acid cycle, TCA cycle, and also known as the Krebs cycle. So we have three different names for the single process that takes place entirely in the matrix of the mitochondria of our cell. Now, before this process can actually begin, we have to break down glucose molecules into pyruvate molecules in the process we call glycolysis, and that takes place in the cytoplasm of the cell. So once we form the pyruvate molecules, if we have plenty of oxygen present in the cell, then the pyruvate molecules will move into the matrix of the mitochondria via a special type of protein found in the membrane of the mitochondria known as pyruvate translocase. And once the pyruvate moves into the matrix of the mitochondria, before it begins the citric acid cycle, we have to transform that pyruvate into acetyl coenzyme A. So ultimately, a two carbon component from the pyruvate is transferred onto a carrier molecule known as coenzyme A or simply CoA. And so once we form this acetyl coenzyme A molecule in the pyruvate decarboxylation process, only then can the citric acid cycle actually begin. And so let's focus on step one. In step one, we have a water molecule. This acetyl coenzyme A as well as an oxaloacetate react to ultimately produce a six carbon molecule known as citrate. So notice we begin with the oxaloacetate, a four carbon molecule, so one, two, three, four. And we begin with this acetyl coenzyme A that contains this two carbon component. And so ultimately what happens in step one is the enzyme known as citrate synthase, synthase catalyzes the transfer of this acetyl group from the acetyl coenzyme A and onto this oxaloacetate and that forms this citrate molecule. So citrate is actually a conjugate base of citric acid and that's why we call this the citric acid cycle. Now this is also an example of a tricarboxylic acid and that's why this is sometimes known as the TCA cycle, tricarboxylic acid cycle. Now, this step is an exergonic step, and under physiological cell conditions, it releases about negative 31.4 kilojoules per mole of energy. And this step, as we discussed previously, actually consists of two different steps. The first step is an aldol condensation. The second step is a hydration reaction, but ultimately we form this citrate molecule from the oxaloacetate and this, uh, and this acetyl coenzyme A. Now, once we form the citrate molecule, it must be transformed into its isomer molecule known as isocitrate. Why? Well, because only the isocitrate can actually undergo the decarboxylation step that takes place in step three. So in step two, we have an isomerization reaction that is catalyzed by aconitase. And what aconitase does is it basically transfers this hydroxyl group shown in orange from this carbon onto this carbon here. So that's the only difference between this citrate molecule and the isomer isocitrate. But now this molecule is actually activated and it's ready to undergo the decarboxylation step that takes place in step three. Now, by the way, I forgot to mention, if we go back to this citrate molecule here, notice that we color coded this molecule. And that's because this violet region basically comes from this section here. And this second oxygen comes from this water molecule shown in blue. Now, I color coded this orange because this is the molecule that is ultimately being transferred onto this carbon here. So the only difference between citrate and isocitrate is the position of this hydroxyl group. It is moved from this location onto this location here. Now, once we form the isocitrate, which by the way is actually an endergonic reaction, we essentially use up about 6.3 kilojoules per mole of energy. Now, once we actually form this isocitrate, now it is ready to actually undergo the first oxidative decarboxylation step that takes place in the citric acid cycle. So, 
What we mean by an oxidative decarboxylation step is we actually have two reactions taking place. We have an oxidation reduction reaction and we have a decarboxylation step. And this step three is catalyzed by the enzyme known as isocitrate because that's the substrate molecule to the dehydrogenase enzyme. So isocitrate, dehydrogenase. And remember, whenever you hear the word dehydrogenase, what that means is we're going to have an oxidation reduction reaction, which electrons are going to be transferred onto a carrier molecule. In this particular case, the nicotine, uh, the, uh, the nicotine amide adenine dinucleotide NAD+. So in step three, we basically reduce the NAD plus into NADH and the H ion and the two electrons essentially come from this molecule here. So this is the hydride ion that is transferred onto the NAD plus to form the NADH. In the process, we essentially uh, oxidize the isocitrate so if this is reduced then this is oxidized and we form the alpha ketoglutarate and also in the process this entire component this carbon dioxide region is basically released and this H atom or the H ion attached to this oxygen is basically released as well and so we form the carbonyl group between this carbon shown here and so the alpha ketoglutarate is now basically ready to undergo the next step. So in the next step, what happens is once again, we, oh, and by the way, the amount of energy that is released in step three is equal to negative 8.4 kilojoules per mole of energy. And actually the formation of the alpha ketoglutarate is the rate determining step. And we'll see why we'll talk about that in much more detail in a future lecture. Now, once we form the alpha ketoglutarate, it now undergoes a second oxidative decarboxylation step. Remember in a citric acid cycle, we have two oxidative decarboxylation steps, and this is the second one. So in step four, we take the alpha ketoglutarate, we essentially react it with coenzyme A, the same coenzyme A that we released in this particular case. And we also have the NAD+, the carrier for the electron. So in this step, what we want to do is, we want to essentially kick off this carbon dioxide shown in blue and replace that with a coenzyme A, which is what we have in this particular case. In the process, we also abstract our electrons, a hydride ion, and we place it onto the NADH or the NAD to form the NADH. So the NAD is reduced and the alpha ketoglutarate is oxidized. We release the carbon dioxide and an H plus ion. And notice we attach the uh, coenzyme A. So we form this very high energy bond known as the thioester bond. So this is essentially the same bond that we have here. So we have that shown here. And the key here is because we form this thioester bond, it will be very unstable high in energy. And when we cleave this bond, it will release a certain amount of free energy that will allow us to actually carry out step five. Now let's move, let's go back to step four in a moment for a moment because we didn't mention the enzyme that catalyzes uh, this step. So we have the substrate molecule is alpha ketoglutarate and the enzyme is basically a, dehydrogen, a dehydrogenase complex. So alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex and it's a complex because we actually have three different enzymes involved in this process and this complex is very similar to the complex that we spoke about in our discussion on pyruvate decarboxylation. So once we form this molecule, this molecule that contains the high energy thioester bond is known as succinyl coenzyme A. And what happens next is we essentially cleave this high energy bond that releases a certain amount of energy and the energy that is released is used to basically uh, drive this reaction here, the addition of the orthophosphate onto the GDP to form the GTP. In the process, we release the coenzyme A. Now, by the way, step four releases negative 30.1 kilojoules per mole of energy, while step five releases negative 3.3 
kilojoules per mole of energy and we also produce the GTP so step five is the only step of the citric acid cycle that actually generates this high energy purine nucleoside triphosphate molecule the GTP now the GTP can either be transformed into ATP or it can actually be used by for instance a G protein to carry out some type of specific process in the cell for instance a signal transduction pathway now the product molecule of step five is succinate and notice that even though we had all these color-coded atoms in these steps here we don't have the color-coded atoms in this step and that's because now this molecule is symmetric no look we have both of these ends contain the c double o negatively charged group and then we have the methylene group in between and so this is a completely symmetrical molecule and that's why we no longer actually use these color-coded atoms now, once we form the uh, succinate, the next reaction, step six, or actually I should generalize, once we form the succinate molecule, notice that we lost the carbon dioxides, two of them, and so we went from a six carbon molecule to a four carbon molecule. And now in steps six, seven, and eight, the entire point is true to transform this four carbon succinate into a four carbon oxaloacetate so that the citric uh, the citric acid cycle can basically begin all over again so that's the goal in step six seven and eight so step six is actually a hydration react or um, oxidation reaction oxidation reduction reaction this is a hydration reaction and this is another oxidation reduction reaction and ultimately we transform this methylene group into this carbonyl group and going and going from this molecule to this molecule in these uh, in these three steps so let's focus on step six step six is catalyzed by succinate dehydrogenase and what this <laughs> does is it ultimately abstracts two H atoms and those two H atoms are then carried by the FAD so we form the FADH2 so we essentially reduce the FAD into this and we oxidize this molecule into fumarate which has a double bond so ultimately one H atom and one H atom here so these two H atoms are basically abstracted and they are placed onto the FAD and so then we form the double bond between these two carbons to form that fumarate and this process actually is at equilibrium it has a Gibbs free energy value of zero kilojoules per mole under the conditions that uh, we find in our cells now in step seven this is a hydration step and it's and, and it's catalyzed by fumarase and what fumarase does is it basically attaches a hydroxyl group from water onto this side and the H ion is attached onto this side and so we form the L isomer of malate and once malate is formed oh and this reaction releases negative 3.8 kilojoules per mole of energy and once we form the malate, now the final enzyme, malate dehydrogenase, is able to actually reduce the NAD plus into NADH, releasing an H plus ion. In the process, we oxidize the malate into oxaloacetate. And now we regenerate this same molecule that we began with, and we can use this uh, same oxaloacetate to basically carry out that same process all over again. So if we sum up all these steps, oh, and by the way, this final step, an oxidation reduction reaction, is a very endergonic reaction. It requires about 29.7 kilojoules per mole of energy. Now, if it's so endergonic, why does it actually take place? Well, because it produces the NADH molecule that then goes on into the electron transport chain and when this is oxidized by the proteins of electron transport chain that process is exergonic and that process helps drive this process here in addition once we form the oxaloacetate it goes on to carry out step one and step one is a very exergonic process so these two steps the 
oxidation of NADH into NAD plus along the electron transport chain and step one of the citric acid cycle helps drive this final step that is a very endergonic step. So if we sum up all these reactions, this will be the net equation, net reaction of the citric acid cycle. So we input an acetyl coenzyme A in step one. We have three NAD plus molecules, one here, one here, and one here. We have a single FAD molecule here. We have a GDP and, a, and an uh, inorganic orthophosphate and two water molecules, one here and one here. And so ultimately we produce the coenzyme A basically here. We have the three NADHs, one in step three, one in step four, and one in step eight. We have the FADH2, one in step six. We have the GTP that is produced in step five, and we have the two carbon dioxides and the two H plus ions. These two carbon dioxides are produced. One is produced in step three, and the other one is produced in step four.